I woke up and I said, God, pleading with God, don't take my sons, please. Just keep them safe. And I'm so grateful those were answered prayers. Because Rod did return safe from his trip, but he did mention he thought he was followed on occasions. And when I told Jeff of my dream, he said cryptically, oh, that's why you were praying. Our parents' prayers are very important and very powerful. My reflections about motherhood draws me to Mary, the mother of Jesus. We first hear of her as a young Jewish teenage girl engaged to Joseph the carpenter. They're a devout, God-worshipping couple, and all seems well. And as we know from the Christmas stories, Mary has this scary visit from the angel Abe from the angel Gabriel. She's told about God's plan for the human race, a son of the Most High, and this would be her child. Although first bewildered and wonders if the angel really knows about biology, she's very brave and trusting in God, and she accepts her part in the plan and becomes miraculously pregnant with Jesus. The risks of social shame and her marriage to Joseph are big, and even being stoned to death. And I'm just so glad that Joseph was a devout, loving man, open to accepting angels and receiving dreams from God. Each Christmas season, the Christian world reflects on how a heavily pregnant Mary and her husband Joseph set off for Bethlehem for the Roman census. As crowded with people traveling and accommodation is scarce, but they do find five-star hotels. No, not quite a hotel. It's a lowly shelter amongst smelly animals under the stars. And then a lowly bunch of terrified shepherds show up with strange tales of more angel encounters and being told to seek the Savior and Messiah. So right from the word go, Jesus is in the company of the poor and marginalized of society. I find the next part of the story very intriguing. As just eight days old, Jesus is, is to be circumcised in the Jerusalem temple. During this occasion, the devout elderly Simeon, touched by the Holy Spirit, blesses the family with prophecies about the baby and also tells Mary a sword will pierce your soul too. And I'm always reminded about this particular scripture. Whenever I hear that poignant song at Christmas time, Mary, did you know? The wealthy society are also represented at Christmas. The Magi, star-studding men, seeking a newborn king, find the family and give them expensive gifts. But when this comes to the notice, the murderous Herod, the family have to flee as refugees to Egypt. And only after Herod's death, four years later, do they dare return to Israel, choosing to live quietly in the northern region of Galilee in a little town, Nazareth. This is not an easy start to motherhood and marriage. And over the years, this devout family annually visit Jerusalem for the Passover feast. On one occasion, 12-year-old Jesus gives them quite a fright. He stood be, um, left behind in the temple with the priests. It took Joseph and Mary three days to find him, and they didn't understand his explanation. And I don't think I would have either. I've got hindsight now. I notice afterwards he did return to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. Moving on in the story, Jesus, the young man, is baptized by John the Baptist. He becomes empowered and filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's told by a voice from heaven that he is the Son of God. The same Holy Spirit leads him into the desert for 40 days, where he fasts and wrestles with his thoughts and temptations and the accuser. John's gospel tells us that his ministry begins at a wedding in Canaan. He's there with his mother, Mary, 
And she's concerned for the host because the wine is running out. And so she asks Jesus to help because this could be a very embarrassing social um, occasion. In spite of his reply, why involve me? She tells the servants to do just as he instructs them. I find this an interesting mother-son interaction as it reminds me how often do children say to parents, why me? And also, how often do we as children of God say, why me? Anyway, Jesus tenderly addresses his mother, dear woman, and he helps produce wonderful wine. Being a mother... Mary would have eagerly followed Jesus and his ministry amongst the sick and the poor and the outcast. And she would hear about the signs and wonders and the upsetting of the priests and the Jewish authorities, all with his claims and his teachings. It was dangerous. It was tiring work. And she would know about the fickle crowds wanting to take advantage of any free food and to see spectacles, the foamer of the day, the fear of missing out. I think the second reading today about brothers and sisters and mothers to Jesus could have been confronting and even hurtful if you don't fully understand what his mission is. And even though Mary had stored treasures in her heart, the family wanted to take charge of Jesus and his well-being. Mark's gospel says he's out of their mind, out of his mind. So I think about this and when I'm worried about my sons, it's really uncomfortable and very difficult to let go. And I think the same would have been for Mary. As if to prove the family's concerns right, there's an awful climax at the cross. What must have gone through Mary's mind? Standing there, heartbroken for her son. How could she comprehend that he is the great I am? The resurrection hadn't happened. And Jesus, in all his excruciating pain, speaks to her from the cross, directing her into the care of John, the disciple who hadn't deserted. And John is to take her into his home as his mother. Caring for women and widows was very important in the Jewish culture. And especially it would have been so under Roman occupation. This tender, loving act of consideration and reassurance for his mother is amongst the last done by the crucified Jesus Christ. And so I ask myself, what do I get from all this for my mother role? First thing, trust God with my children, no matter what, at all times. Pray. Take all your concerns, all your worries, to the Lord in prayer. Love. Love unconditionally. Be supportive, respectful, affirming, because I'm the only mother that they have. And study a word. Be courageous and try and live for what is right, as Jesus teaches, showing kindness and care. And give thanks. Give thanks to God for all his blessings along the way in all the situations, and store treasure in my heart. So I thank God for the amazing gift of motherhood in my life. And I leave you with a poem by a lady called Joyce Henning. It's called He'll See Them Home. Don't despair so of your children. God will bring them to the fold, because he died to save them, and they're special to the Lord. He knows how much you love them. He loves them even more. And as long as you hold on in prayer, he'll not close the door. And even now, he sees your tears. And he whispers tenderly of love that conquered all, that mankind might be free. So lay them at his altar and let go and leave them there. God will be faithful to your trust and he won't withhold his care. His hand will ever nurture, no matter where they roam, and he won't be satisfied till he sees them safely home. Praise to the Lord God Almighty.
Amen. Thank you, beautiful Geraldine. Don't you all wish that she was your mum? I do. I'm just so thankful to have Geraldine as a spiritual mother, mother in the Lord, mother in the church, or sister probably. And um, yeah, I just give thanks for all of our church family, brothers and sisters, and um, spiritual parents. And yeah, we are just so blessed. Uh, but I just really appreciate your vulnerability and your honesty and your parenthood and what a mighty application that we can all apply um, to our own families. And I think your sons and Lexi are the most blessed children alive today. I hope you have a lovely lunch with them. Now, this year is the first time I have Mother's Day in an empty nest. All my kids have grown up and fled and I miss them terribly. So it's a little bit sad and uh, you know it's been a tough couple of years in our family with all sorts of things going on so it's actually a hard day for me today but I have been also reflecting this week much on my spiritual children in Africa most of you know I went to Africa about eight years ago in Zambia spent a lot of time with some widows a lot of time with some orphans and they have stole my heart my heart is still there and I love them so dearly and so that is something I can talk about today a little bit with you there's a very special verse in the Bible in Psalm 68 it reminds us that God is a father to the fatherless a defender of widows and he sets the lonely in families so it's just such a beautiful privilege for us to have this family of God here in this church, extended family, spiritual family, and also in Africa, hands at work in Africa, they are extended family too. They operate like a family and God's family, of course, extends all that far as well. And so today I just want to talk a little bit about what hands at work are doing in Africa, in Zambia, in Baraka in particular, that's a community we uh, sponsor we sponsor some children there uh, the ties of the children in kingdom kids goes to baraka and many of us in this parish support them with sponsorship for 25 dollars a week we've currently i believe just raised enough money for a shelter over a kitchen which is awesome thank you for all your support because Hands at Work are doing amazing stuff. I just want to tell you a little bit of a story about Makani. So he's one of six children in his family. His mum died a few years ago of AIDS. After a while, his dad, uh, in his brokenness, just left. No one knows where he is. He abandoned the children. And so these six little children were left to fend for themselves. Uh, they split the kids up. They put three with the auntie, three with the grandma. And when the Hands at Work team went to visit the grandma just to see how they're going, they walked through the community, they found that they really didn't have enough food as the grandma was doing the best she could, but just not enough to feed the kids. They had no warm clothes and no blankets. So Hands at Work went to the local church where they mobilise and, and empower the church to support these orphans. And, um, and they provided for their needs. So Hands at Work just does this amazing work out in Baraka. Now, if you ever went to Baraka, we were going to go last year on a mission trip, but we didn't get there due to COVID. But if you drive a long, long way off the tar roads into the bush on the dirt tracks, which is the wet season's really muddy, you have to drive through rivers basically because the, the bridges are underwater, you'll find just a shelter. And this is where people have been gathering, waiting for breakfast, because in the wet season too, all the harvest crops have been ruined. So they actually, Hands at Work, are giving uh, the people of Baraka breakfast each day just to help them out, to get them through this wet season. And also doing amazing things of building houses. So most of them live in mud brick huts, just with little thatched roofs. And in the heavy, wet, raining season, the, the mud bricks just melt and wash away. So hands at work, the team went into Baraka one day and just found a widow with her two little orphans, or not orphans, her two little kids, sitting under her kitchen 
very small shelter thing where they would cook usually and that has holes in the in the roof so it's leaking and it's muddy and it's just a dirt floor and they're trying to stay in there so the team just got around her and prayed with her and tried to encourage her to have hope and hold off to the next week when they could mobilize the local church to come and build her a brick house that will never wash away and the youngest boy he's, uh, who lives there now, he's just five years old and he's so proud of his brick house. He'll show anyone who comes along where he lives because he's so excited about it. Now, I could tell you lots more stories about what's happening over there, but I want to play a little video of George Snyman. He visited here a couple of years ago. You might remember telling us about his work with Hands at Work. So we might just put that up now. I've watched that so many times this week and I'm still crying. So touching. I love the work that Hands at Work do. Not only do they do education and food and really basic health care, but they love those children and give them a hug. When I was there about eight years ago, I sat on the ground outside a grandma's house. And through the translator, the grandma told me the story of the little girl who was just sitting nearby on the ground. And she told me how her mum died of AIDS and then her dad died of AIDS and she went to live with her aunt who also died of AIDS and there was no uncle around. And as the grandma told me this story, the little girl sat in the dirt crying and no one hugged her and no one comforted her and it just broke my heart. I could not not <laughs> hug her. And so I just went over and gave her a hug and that's what Hands at Work do. They love on these children and it's life changing. Such a different world, third world country to first world that we know. And we think it's a bit hard that, you know, I'm struggling with my mum a bit. She's annoying me lately. <laughs> but I have a mum. I'm so grateful for that. And um, yeah, we just have so much to be thankful for. And so I consider those kids in Africa my spiritual kids my spiritual family, just like we are spiritual family here and I'm so grateful for you. I think it's wonderful to be in this together as God's great big family. And I remember what Jesus said, what Geraldine read to us. You are my, Jesus said to, um, to his disciples, his followers, like, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Anyone who does the will of God is my brother and sister and father and mother. Anyone who does the things that my Father in heaven wants. And we know what God wants. He wants us to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with God, the scriptures tell us. And James tells us that the religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless. It's to look after orphans and widows in their distress. That's what religion is. And I just think it's a privilege that we can love and care for widows and orphans even so far away. And I just want to remind us all today to care for those among us who might be doing it tough this Mother's Day too. Maybe you don't have family and maybe you're alone. If you want to, you can come to picnic in the park with me and my mum. It'd be nice. <laughs> but God sets the lonely in families and I just, I love that about God. And I just pray that as we keep providing and keep sharing our riches and abundance with those less fortunate than us, that God will continue to meet all your needs abundantly for relationship, for finances, for whatever your needs are for your family. We'll keep praying as Geraldine uh, encouraged us to do before, praying for those uh, that we care about. We always worry about our kids, I think, but God says come to him in prayer. So we can pray about all these things and we're going to have opportunity to do that now. I've put on each table uh, just some, some sheets about... Baraka, a bit about Africa, some are updates, some are a bit old, some are prayer uh, lists. But if I just give you just a couple of minutes silence, would you just pray for the orphans and widows in Africa? And then I'll invite uh, Roger to come forth and lead us in prayer today.